Thanks for coming out today, guys. My name is Rob Gifford, as, as was mentioned there, uh, Director of Experience Design at MadPal. And I've been working in the experience design field for over the, for over the last decade here. And a lot of that's been in the financial services industry. Um, and one thing that just keeps coming up over and over again is choices and how do we simplify those for people. I think one of the reasons that this comes up over and over again is that we're at a point in time where choices are actually increasing uh, pretty exponentially. And uh, that's true in e-commerce, of course, but also in the financial services industry where companies are reaching out directly to consumers, giving them information uh, about products um, and asking them to make serious choices um, that have a big effect on their lives, right? But the problem is that without, with the absence of agents and brokers to, to guide these uh, consumers, uh, people are actually stuck making decisions about things that are, they're pretty unfamiliar with uh, and they have a big impact on their life. Uh, and so what this means is that you know, they need help, right? So we as people who are crafting financial and uh, financial and customer experiences are kind of ideally situated uh, to simplify these decisions. In this presentation, I'm going to walk you through sort of a little bit about the psychology of choice and also some principles and, and strategies we can use to simplify these decisions. Before we get into that, I think it's important to, to talk a little bit about sort of the role that choice plays in our life, right? Um, and one of the things that, um, you know, one of the values that we derive from choice really is that it, it offers us autonomy. It offers us a sense of control um, in our lives. Autonomy is a super important basic human drive. When we have autonomy, we feel uh, motivated and we feel engaged. So sort of an example of this is uh, my daughter who's 16 months. We're, we're teaching her to uh, feed herself with a spoon and a fork. Um, and she only gets about half the food in her mouth uh, when she's doing this. But if you take that spoon away from her and try to feed her, she won't eat any of it. And I think that you know, in terms of our consumer lives, we're all a little bit like my daughter here. We want to uh, We want to have control. And when we have control, uh, we are uh, more invested in the products and services that we purchase. Right, or we interact with. Uh, to illustrate this example, here's a project we worked um, on for a, uh, a large insurance company. Um, it's a homeowner's quote flow. And really, you know, what we did is we were trying to validate two different concepts here. Um, one was, you know, it, they were all kind of based around how do we deliver uh, this quote to folks, to customers. One was a personalized recommendation where we uh, we walked uh, people through their coverages and we displayed one policy for them, right? kind of narrowing their focus down but making sure we explained everything. Uh, and the second concept, we simply just gave three different options. Right? And we, what we wanted to understand is what, uh, in which concept did people feel more confident in. And uh, you know, not surprisingly, this is all about choice, but I think it was kind of counterintuitive that almost everybody rated concept to be where they just had three options. As the, as the product that allowed them, or the experience that gave them more confidence uh, in what they were buying, even though we were giving them more content on concept A, right? And so that just goes to show that we, um, we need choice and we need involvement in what we're buying in order to feel confidence. There's something just kind of basic and foundational about that. Now, one of the reasons I think that we feel more confident when we have choice, we're offered choice, is because we all see ourselves as unique, right? We, we, we have unique lives that result in unique needs and preferences from the products and services that we buy. And so I think the assumption really is, kind of in the back of our mind, both in terms of companies and, and customers, that the more options we have, um, the more likely we are to find a perfect match for our unique needs and our unique preferences. The only issue with that is that people overestimate their ability to analyze all these op options and sift through to find the perfect one. Right, because we have some really specific, um, specific limitations as people, really. Um, we're cognitive misers. We're always looking for ways to conserve our mental energy and attention. Oftentimes, especially in the financial space, we don't really understand the domain that well. Right? The average consumer isn't an expert in these, and there are some pretty complicated concepts that, that they need to wrap their head around in order to make good decisions. And finally, we look to the future with biases. We're over, either overly optimistic uh, because we, you know, we have optimism bias or we look to the future and we uh, are overly pessimistic about things that aren't going to be big risks just because they're easy to call to mind and think about. 
So instead of finding our perfect option, uh, we often experience choice overload. We, we feel a sense of anxiety. Um, we even defer on choices because we don't want to make the wrong choice and regret it later on. And we also make poorer choices than we expect sometimes. Right, so as people that are crafting experience, customer experiences, our job is really to account for these human limitations that we know people have um, to make them feel more confident in the choices they're, they're making, to make those choices simple and effortless, or less effortful at least. In order to kind of think about how do we, how do we go about this, right? Any given choice, what makes any given choice difficult or complicated, it's really the, comp the complexity of the set of options they're offering people. How many different options are they? How different are they from each other? And the lack of knowledge and preferences that our, um, that our customers bring to the decision, right? So people that with a high degree of expertise, a lot of experiences, they may be able to handle a more complex, a more complex set of options. So it follows from this that um, you know, if we want to simplify the decisions that we're offering up to our customers, there's really two main strategies, or two sort of buckets of strategies that we want to, um, we want to think about. Uh, first is how do we orient customers uh, to all the options we're offering them? How do we make it easy to compare them? And secondly, how do we increase customers' expertise so we, they can behave more like experts and have well-informed, strong, and accurate preferences? I'll we'll walk you through all five of these uh, strategies, but you know, just we'll keep coming back to these two main um, these two main goals here. So probably the most foundational and, and um, the first thing we need to do is figure out what the right selection size to offer people is. Right? How much choice should we offer? And the important thing to note here is that there's a sweet spot, right? So offer too little choice, people don't feel invested, um, and they're not likely to find a perfect match for their needs offer too much choice and you're requiring too much time, effort, and investment um, in order to find, find the perfect choice, right? And the people feel anxiety there. We talked about that. So there is a sweet spot in terms of selection size that leads to confidence and satisfaction. There's no hard and fast rules around this, but what we do have is uh, one of the most va validated principles in uh, cognitive psychology, which is Miller's Law. It says that the amount of things that we can hold in our mind at any given time is around seven items, right? That's the maximum. Uh, so what does that have to do with choices? Well, choices are incredibly, making a choice is incredibly memory intensive. It's a memory intensive activity to compare different options. You actually have to remember something about um, each option as you compare it to the next option. So what we want to do is we don't want to exceed this limit in terms of that comparison activity. All right? That doesn't mean that you can't offer more than uh, seven products or more than five products, um, but it, it means that if you're going to go beyond this, you need to start categorizing those choices and categorizing those options for people or staging the decision out over a series of steps. Now, even if we offer people the right amount of options, uh, the right amount of uh, products, if those, if those options are, are too similar, people will still struggle to make a decision, right? Uh, because they won't have any basis to, to choose one over another. So what we need to do is we need to make options distinct. Um, and we can do that uh, by really looking at the specific needs of key user segments and prioritizing those key user segments, aligning the attributes and variables of each option uh, to a recognizable uh, segment, right? And so uh, and then we need, what we need to do is really communicate those differences very clearly to, to, to users through the experiences we design. Jetty, this, this is a screenshot from Jetty, which is an insurtech startup company. They do a great job in terms of just the overall choice architecture they're providing customers. So you can see what they're doing here is they're offering um, three different renter's insurance plans. They're summarizing each option, right? So people don't have to they can quickly scan across uh, and get a sense uh, for, for what each option entails using these labels. They're also providing text that allows um, their, their users to quickly see who these options might be good for if you care, you know, what, depending on whether you care about, um, you know, price versus the comprehensiveness of, of, the, of the coverage itself. Um, some other things they're doing here that are really great in terms of creating that distinction between options is they're really honing down on the amount of level of detail and the amount of information they're providing about each, each option. So if they, so they're really highlighting just the key features of these renter's insurance plans belongings, um, liability, 
these are just these are the things that are most likely that the people are most likely to file a claim against. So they're most Im most important for people to consider when they're making the choice. Um, you know, and this is one of those things where you think just offering you might think that offering more and more detail might help people make a better decision. But actually, what that does is it um, it kind of creates red herrings in terms of the comparison process, where people are now waiting things that aren't necessarily as relevant against other th parts of an option in order, to, um, in, to, in order to make a decision. And the final thing they're doing really well is they're varying these options um, significantly, right? So they have different levels of cover significantly different levels of coverage and price to align to um, you know, the unique needs that people have, whether you're price sensitive or uh, you care more about um, comprehensiveness of coverage. Even if we make the comparison process easier, if we structure the decision to make, uh, make it easier by um, finding the sweet spot in terms of options and making them really distinct, if customers don't have the expertise in making or experience in making the decision, it can still be difficult for them, right? So what we need to do is to increase that cu those customers' expertise and help build those preferences for folks. Sort of the most foundational way we can do that is by making the decision space understandable. Right. At a basic level, that means eliminating jargon. That may sound obvious, but time and time again, in, in engagements, we run into words like this, right? Dwelling coverage, other covered peril is deductible. What does that mean? Your average customer doesn't know what those terms mean, right? I think this arises, terms like these arise uh, from a desire to be very uh, clear and, and, um, and comprehensive in terms of all the details that we're providing or we're communicating about a concept, right? So there's a desire to convey nuance there. Uh, but what, what actually happens is those kind of terms just wash over our customers and our users, right? And so um, you know, that can lead to more and more anxiety about the choice because they may feel like, you know, I don't understand these. I, I, I'm not, re not really prepared to make this decision. Or at a, mi at a minimum, they're not going to make as an informed decision because they don't understand the concepts that we're dealing with. So it, it's kind of counterintuitive that in a desire to be more nuanced about the terms that we we use, um, we actually create a less informed uh, decision for the customer. So it's important that we, you know, when we're looking at a project, that we um, a lot of time uh, to work with legal and product partners to be able to uh, address some of these terms. So these are some examples of how we reframed these uh, terms for a project that we did for another large insurance company. Even if folks, um, even if our customers understand the concepts, we need to we need to also make it real for them, right? Uh, we need to really bring those abstract principles to life. Uh, and one of the ways that we can do this is by using scenarios, right? Just as we use scenarios to bring the context of our users and our customers to life when we're making decisions for them, uh, we can use scenarios to really bring uh, these financial concepts to life for our customers. So this is an example of um, a project we worked on where, uh, this is for renter's insurance, um, where uh, we, we did some research that uncovered that people are not, uh, renters are, they don't know what liability coverage means or what it entails, right? So this is a key part of renter's insurance. Uh, so what we did is we reframed liability insurance in terms of the value that it would provide to people and used sort of recognizable, relatable events where um, re uh, liability coverage would, would be invoked. So for example, if your dog bites somebody at a park or you, know, you leave the faucet on in your house and it, a leak damages your neighbor's apartment. So this was really effective in conveying that meaning to people and really you know, bringing, that, bringing those concepts to life. Now, even if people understand the decision space really well, uh, we need to give them guidance uh, around what a good decision looks like. And uh, one of the ways we can do this is by providing simple rules of thumb. The reason that these are effective is because, um, you know, as I mentioned, people are cognitive misers, right? They're, they're always looking for ways to spend less mental energy and attention on something. So, um, so it's, it follows from that that it's sort of a good enough choice spent over a few minutes or that requires a few minutes is actually preferable than a, a perfect choice um, that takes hours or days to make, right, or a lot of mental energy to make. It's a process called satisficing. Uh, it's, it's pretty well kind of documented and validated that that's kind of how people behave when it comes to decisions. Um, and so providing people with these simple rules of thumb can actually kind of assist them in that process. They already have that nature where they're going to try to 
uh, make a good enough decision. We can at least equip them with things like validated simple formulas um, to use to come up with answers. Social proof. People are already looking for uh, word of mouth recommendations, but if we have data about what people choose, uh, we, can off we can make that more effective. And uh, even trust seals and ratings are, are, are a, a powerful way to do this. Now finally, the, uh, probably the most effective way we can simplify decisions is by um, circumventing the need uh, for people to understand detailed, unfamiliar um, things about our products in general and focus on something that they are experts in, which is their own plans and their own goals. We can do this by reframing choices uh, in terms of the future consequences of selecting one option over another. Right? I'm not suggesting that all of our experiences that we design. <laughs> well, I you're saying. Um, I'm not suggesting that all of our experiences we design are, uh, should start with an interview, uh, but we move more towards something like what financial advisors, how they would have conversations where they don't ask you about what type of, uh, what type of fund you want or even what your rate of return that you want is. They ask you about things like, um, I ask you about things like when do you want to retire, right? And, and what type of lifestyle do you want when you retire? It's about moving from very product-centric decision experiences like this, where you have to really kind of wrap your head around a lot of different details, to uh, decisions like this, right? Target date funds, right? Offering up things that align to people's goals. Or even scenario modeling, where people can put in a couple details about um, you know, a couple details that they know and really see how that affects the future outcome. You know, Betterment is a great example of this. Um, it's, they've really done a great job of simplifying the investment process, wrapping up um, you know, different funds together and really kind of making it easier for people to interact with those. So at the end of the day, I think you know, what I'm trying to say here is that um, you know, choice is with us, right? We, we, people need choice. People want choice. It serves it a really important function in our lives. But if we don't design these choices uh, intentionally to account for people's limitations, they're going to feel overwhelmed, they're going to feel anxious, and, um, and they may even make poorer decisions. We can account for these limitations by helping customers orient, be oriented to their options, offering them the right selection size, making those options distinct, and uh, increasing customers' expertise, helping them behave more like experts so they can recognize what a good choice looks like. Thank you. And we have a question. Instead of presenting options, is there room for personalized recommendations? I think there is, yeah. I mean, so that was kind of what we were trying to get at with that initial concept test. I wouldn't, it, what we found is that some options, offering a limited set of options were actually, was more effective in terms of building confidence. Um, there are ways that you can offer a personalized recommendation um, and still help people feel invested and feel like they're in control. So that Betterment example was a way to do that. Um, I think there are lots of ways to do that, but I think the thing that you want to account for is autonomy, giving people enough uh, sense of involvement in that recommendation. So I've given you personal information that I know how it correlates to the recommendation and actually uncovering, sort of opening up the hood just a little bit on how your algorithm works Right, and, and showing people where that recommendation is coming from. Not overwhelming them with detail, but just giving them, giving them just enough detail that they can have confidence in what you're recommending. And one more question. How did you test option A versus option B? Was it by preference and sense of confidence? Yeah, yeah. so this was a qualitative test. So we ran people through, or they, they actually, it was self, kind of self-driven. They ran through these different quote flows. We did have a quantitative aspect to it where we asked people to rank on a scale of 1 to 10, uh, which one they preferred, which one they felt was easier, and then which one they felt more confidence in what they're actually um, receiving at the end. So there's a qualitative and quantitative aspect, but it was really just kind of a, a user uh, sort of self-driven user test. And perhaps most importantly, what's that cool ringtone and how do I get it? <laughs> it comes standard on the iPhone, iPhone 8. So. Thank you.